Isaiah chapter number 60, you can go ahead and turn there, is, a, is an entire chapter completely dedicated to the glorious future that Israel has. It's not dealing at all with Israel's now and now. It's not dealing at all with their sin or with um, correcting it. It is dealing with something amazing, something glorious that is going to come for Israel one day. And so that's why I've titled this chapter and the sermon on this, you know, Isaiah 60, a glorious future for Israel. No doubt Israel has had a pretty bleak past. There have certainly been some wonderful times for the nation of Israel in its past. When it finally was able to take control of the land of Canaan uh, way back you know, in 1000 BC, it finally was able to settle itself there in the land of Israel. It began its own dynasty of kings, beginning with Saul and then David and following. Uh, and it had, it reached its peak, its zenith, it seemed, during Solomon's day. Its heyday of strength and of beauty and of glory and of power. And there were some other good kings along, even during the, uh, the split kingdom, that same thing, where they saw some pretty glorious times. So some heights of power, of wealth, of prosperity, and of influence there in that area of righteousness, of God you know, putting his hands into the affairs of Israel and helping them in many ways. So yeah, they've certainly had some glorious times, but I'll tell you what, ever since the Babylonian captivity, which Isaiah warns, was, is, is preaching and warning all throughout his book is coming, is going to happen. Ever since the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, Israel's really never been able to recover. Now, within recent years, within the last, let's say, 80 years, uh, post-World War II, Israel is once more given uh, land back there along the Mediterranean coast that was once theirs. You know, back during Bible times, people argue that, no, that's actually uh, Palestinian land. Um, well, it was it at one point there, sure, before that. It was Israel's land. Before it was Israel's land, it was the Canaanites' land. Before it was the Canaanites' land, it was who knows. You know, the same thing with the United States. I was just saw a video yesterday about the Black Hills, you know, where um, the Mount Rushmore is. And there's a push to give that land of the Black Hills back to uh, the Indians. I'm trying to think of the exact name of the tribe. It's not the Iroquois. It's the Lakota. Uh, the Lakota Indians that, uh, who had it when we got that land from them. Uh, but they got that land, stole it, or not, so basically conquered it and took it from another tribe. And I saw a history of all the various tribes over uh, time that have been in control of that land and have taken control of it from another. And you have to ask yourself, well, then who exactly are we going to be paying, you know, um, or giving this land back to? And uh, we live in a very different time uh, than has ever been lived in, uh, where we think very differently. But Israel's existence today is, is fraught with danger, no doubt. I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to tell you that everything that they do is perfect, just like I wouldn't say everything that the United States does is perfect. But I do love my country, and I do believe that uh, we have certainly done far more good uh, than we have done harm. But we look specifically at Israel's past, but at its future. And so let's think again about who is talking here. We have the prophet Isaiah. And he is speaking to a crowd of, of Jewish people there in Jerusalem and southern Israel. And he is foretelling, and no doubt, no doubt this message was also spread about through to northern Israel as well, but he is foretelling about some future very dark times for Israel. And why did those dark times come? Well, we were told that in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, those dark times are coming for Israel because of their disobedience. Because of the rejection of God, because of their, they chose to worship false gods. They chose to incorporate that cultish worship and try to do the temple worship all at the same time. And so God says, I'm, I'm tired of the disobedience. I have corrected you and you have gotten right. And then you've turned right back around and done wrong again. And I've corrected you and you've gotten right. And it's happened over and over throughout the judges and throughout the early kings over and over and over and over, and I'm tired of it, Israel. I'm just tired of it. You have keep sidelining yourselves with your disobedience and your rebellion, and so I'm going to bring some serious judgment. And, of course, we 
have the Assyrians that come and destroy northern Israel, the Babylonians that come and destroy southern Israel. But in chapter number 60, he is talking about something glorious that is to come in the future. Now, let me preface that with, you know, as I say, up concerning much of prophecy, it has a short-term fulfillment um, often, and it has a long-term fulfillment uh, often. Sometimes there's that short-term fulfillment of Cyrus, of the Medes and Persians, allowing them to return back to Jerusalem after captivity. But then there's also a long-term fulfillment, which is what I really feel that Isaiah 60 is really leaning into here, is the long-term fulfillment of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And just so we're clear on what the millennial reign of Jesus Christ is, remember that um, after the second coming, well, let's, let's just back up. Right now we live in the church age. At the end of the church age, there is going to be the rapture. This is when the church is called up, caught up into heaven to be with God. During that time of the great tribu or during the tribulation period, there's seven years there where the church has been called up and we are in the presence of God. This is when the, the marriage supper of the lamb is going on uh, during that time period among, as well as um, the judgment seat of Christ going on during that time, which us, the church is going to be a part of. But during that seven years on earth, uh, you're going to have the Antichrist. He's going to rise to power. He's going to see a short period of peace. The whole world is going to love this guy. But he is going to see a, see a short period of peace. And let me, let me also point this out. He is going to broker peace with Israel and the other nations. That's something interesting to watch for. As you see some politicians pushing peace between Israel and some other nations like the UAE and Saudi Arabia and, yeah, even Iran. Um, and... When you see this person who is actually able to broker peace, now it's going to be a very short-lived peace. And following that peace, when it breaks, we're going to see war the scale of which we have not yet seen during the Great Tribulation, that latter three and a half years of the Tribulation period. Well, at the end of that Great Tribulation, the latter half of those three and a half years uh, is going to be the Battle of Armageddon. It's all going to come to a head. Jesus is going to actually return now for the second time, riding on his white horse, we're going to come out of the clouds with him, riding on our own horses. And I don't ride horses. Um, that's awfully high off the ground to be riding something that could kill me, right? And uh, we're going to have to ride them out of the sky. When? Riding on a horse, out of the sky. I don't know what you're talking about. Are you dead? I'm not sure. Coming back from heaven with Jesus, are you dead? Well, maybe not. We could have been raptured. Oh, I see. I, I didn't already did. I already died. Gotcha. Okay. Anyways, thanks for completely just taking the wheels off my carriage there. All right, moving on. Battle of Armageddon, end of the Great Tribulation. Jesus comes back. We come back with him. Ignore the riding horses from the sky comments. Um, and it's at that point that, that Jesus... Uh, just destroys the armies of the world that the Antichrist and the false prophet have risen up against him, destroys them, takes the Antichrist, takes the false prophet, casts them into the lake of fire for an eternity. Okay, now, it is at that point that he also takes the dragon, which is Satan, the devil, Lucifer, many names for him. He takes the dragon and he binds him and puts him in the lake of fire for a thousand years. Um, he will be released again at the end of that thousand years, what we refer to as the millennial reign, because millennium is a thousand years, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And Jesus will literally physically be on this earth, ruling and reigning on this earth in this Jerusalem. Well, I mean, obviously this is a Verona, but the Jerusalem over in Israel. He will be literally physically ruling and reigning, and we will be there with him. Now, it is also during this tribulation period that the heart of Israel is going to be turned back to God. And some might say, but don't they already worship God? They do, but they do not believe in Jesus Christ as Messiah. Salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. No matter who you are, no matter what your ethnic background is, salvation only comes through Jesus Christ, not just for the Gentiles like us, but also for the Jews. And if they've rejected Christ, they only have one end, the same as you and I would if we rejected Christ. But there will come a time during that tribulation time where God will turn his attention away from the church because it's been raptured back onto Israel once more. In Revelation 4, we see John get caught up and suddenly he's in the presence of God. And then we don't hear about the church anymore after that because 
Now he turns his attention back to Israel when we read about Israel, 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 Israel. I don't believe in replacement theology, which means that the church has replaced Israel. And that if you see the re um, references to Israel in the book of Revelation, that that must be, mean it's the church instead. I don't believe in replacement theology. Uh, God promised many times throughout the book of Isaiah. I've pointed out a lot of times now. See, here's a promise. See, here's a covenant God made with Israel that he would never cast them aside, that he would never completely reject them. And these covenants and promises God made to them. God is not the kind of God that reneges on his promises or on his covenants. And so that church is going to be raptured. He's going to turn his attention back to Israel. Then there's that millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And we think about that millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where Jesus is literally ruling and reigning there from Jerusalem. There are still going to be people on this earth that don't believe. However, that aside, the whole dynamic of our world is going to be extraordinarily different during that time. You say, how do you know? Because of what we're going to read here in chapter number 60. Um, why is the dynamic different? Uh, why does everybody suddenly start looking positively towards Jerusalem? As opposed to the way things are now, uh, where there is so much negativity placed upon that tiny, tiny little sliver of a country on the Mediterranean coast. Um, why will there suddenly be so much of a good spotlight upon it then? Well, let's read. Isaiah chapter number 60, I've given you a long introduction and review and a synopsis of the book of Revelation and everything. Um, I remind you, if you want to learn more about the book of Revelation and or have forgotten some things or want to go back over it, uh, on the church website, there is a page called Watch Now, and you scroll to probably close to the bottom. Um, there is a, a channel there that's got all of the Revelation series Bible study on it. I think there was way too many, um, maybe 45, 45, 46 uh, lessons that we went through going through the book of Revelation, studying it. There could have been more, uh, but there was a lot there. Now, I wasn't using this microphone, so um, it's just relying on the microphone from the camera, so you might have to turn it up a little bit, uh, but uh, there's a lengthy study that we've gone through in the book of Revelation there if you're interested in going and hearing that. Now, Isaiah 60. Look at verse number one. It says this, Arise, Shine. I'm sorry, I'm not saying this nearly excited enough. I feel like it's it's not, I'm tired at the end of the day, arise, shine. I feel like it's a little bit more exciting than that. So let's try again. Ready? Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and gl the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light. And kings to the brightness of thy rising. Okay, we see a lot of references to light and darkness here. Now, this is in direct contrast to look back at chapter 59. Look at 59 verse 9. It says in 59 verse 9, Therefore is judgment, this is Israel speaking, because of our sin, because of our rejection of God, therefore is judgment far from us. Neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold, obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. And we are in desolate places as dead men. Think about how Israel is talking there in chapter 59, verses 9 and 10. They recognize we are in darkness and we have willingly placed ourselves in darkness. And then we go to chapter 60, verse 1, and he says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. What is Israel's light? Let's we'll stop and think about something. When it gets dark, what do we typically do? Okay, Spartan Alex. Let's try this again. <laughs> At nighttime, what do we usually do? Sleep. We go to bed. That's what I'm looking for. We go down and we go, I mean, at least I do. I don't know about y'all, but when it gets dark, we lay down and we go to sleep. And when it gets light again, you rise up. And so you see this image here of the sun coming up over the horizon. Who is the sun? What is the sun here in this image that he's painting for us? 
Is that east? Yeah, that's east. So I'm, I got it right. No, that's not. Yeah, it is. That's east. Anybody? What's the sun? What's the light here that's coming up over the horizon? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, the Messiah. He's the sun. He's the light. Just pause and think about something here. He is not looking at Israel and saying, oh, you blessed and wonderful people. I'm so proud of you. You're just this bright, shining nation to the world. That's not the message here at all. In fact, Isaiah for 59 chapters has not had much good to say about the people of Israel. But he has a whole lot of good things to say about God. Jesus did come. Jesus came and they rejected him. Many Gentiles even rejected him. Many reject him still today. But Isaiah is pointing to a future time when the sun comes up over the horizon yet again. And now it's time to get up, arise, and shine. Are they supposed to shine of their own light or of their own righteousness or of their own goodness? No, of course not. They are merely reflecting the sun, reflecting Jesus Christ. That's what you and I are supposed to do right now. We're not supposed to be a light unto ourselves. Look at my amazing Christianity and my religiosity, and I just want everybody to see what a good person I am, rather than I just want to be a mirror, a reflection of God. Just let Jesus reflect his goodness in me back out at others. Let me simply be that, that when others look at me, they don't see me, that they don't learn to know my name, that they would only instead learn Christ's name from me, that he is glorified in me, that I'm not glorified. And so he says these things to Israel, arise and shine for thy light is come. He says, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon me for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness, the people, but the Lord shall arise upon me. The Lord shall arise upon thee. In case you were wondering if Colton was right, that the son was, the, was Jesus, here he says it. The Lord shall rise, arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen. When we stop and think about these future events, we're talking about Israel becoming uh, the singular focus of the entire world. I mean, it kind of is today, right? I, I, can't, I can't open up the news without seeing um, Israel-Palestinian conflict or uh, college students, you know, doing real ridiculousness on their um, campuses because of the Israeli-Hamas conflict, uh, Free Palestine, and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, right now, it is the center fo central focus of the whole world, eclipsing so many other important things, like, like the, the civil war in, in Sudan, like Russia and Ukraine and uh, Haiti and the problems they're having down there. There's a whole lot of things that this tiny little country right now uh, is eclipsing in the world's news. But one day during the millennial reign of, reign of Christ, it will be the central focus of the entire world, but for a good reason. There's another word, another picture I get here, and I, don't, I, I, I know that Isaiah did not necessarily intend this word picture, but nevertheless, it comes to mind anyways. I used to sit, I remember going to Mama and Papap's house, and they had a house out by the river, and um, that we would sit out in the front porch a lot, and underneath, hanging underneath a big, big tree is the, was those bug zappers, you know what I'm talking about, with the blue lights, and uh, they go, zzz, 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 you know, and I just, I loved sitting there as a kid and watching the bugs, you know, fly into that and, you know, explode. Uh, it was great fun, and you know my neighbor has one, and so I can hear. Uh, it makes me happy to hear the mosquitoes just frying out there because I can't stand the mosquitoes. Um, but this is that's what this verse makes me think of. Let me read it again and see if you think of it. And the Gentiles, verse three, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Now the Gentiles aren't coming to be killed here; <laughs> they're not coming to the slaughter. Uh, so that's where the the, the illustration ends. Uh, but when they see, they see this brightness, they see hope, they see future. And let's think about it. Why would all of the Gentile nations around the world care about what's going on in little old Jerusalem at this time? Well, remember this. They have undergone some severe catastrophes. I mean, we're talking about um, well over 
half of the world becoming uninhabitable. I don't know what wormwood is. You know, we talked about that. Uh, dealing, uh, making a third of the Earth's water um, uninhabitable. You, know, you couldn't use it. I don't know if that's nuclear fallout or what it is. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us information, and so I won't bother to speculate. But you, you also see great geographic catastrophes, massive earthquakes, volcanoes, what appear to be volcanoes. Uh, you also see things falling from the sky and causing uh, great harm. You also have you know, massive wars of people against people. You have the Battle of Armageddon. The systems that, were, that are in place right now, they're not going to be in place at that point. I wonder to myself if by the time the millennial reign of Jesus Christ begins, is there going to be a banking system? Is there going to be electric? Is there going to be plumbing? Uh, is there going to be any of these things? I mean. With the great catastrophes that are going to go on during the Great Tribulation, how much infrastructure is going to be left? I don't, again, I can't speculate. I just, I, I, that's something that I think about every now and then. But then, in the midst of all that darkness, so much has been lost. So much life has been lost. So much blood has been shed. So much future hope has been lost. And then there is this man. There is this God in the land of Israel, and he's a good man. He's righteous. He's holy. He's loving. He's caring. He cares genuinely for his people, and everybody hears about it. The, it it's like the sun is rising. You know, sometimes I sit out during deer season, and I sit out in a tree stand, and it's like 20 degrees out there. And I'm shivering. I have who knows how many layers on. I have hot hands, you know, in my pockets. And I walked out there in the dark, and I'm sitting out there. And let me tell you something. I'm, I, I don't ever intend to sit on a west-facing mountainside on a 20-degree morning. And the reason is because I want to be on an east-facing mountainside because that's where the sun comes up. And there is just something glorious about freezing. And then the sun comes up over the mountains and it's just bathing you in sunlight. Even if it's 20 degrees outside, that feels amazing. And it just makes the whole day feel hopeful uh, when the sun comes up over that mountain. There's just that, that one focus. I just want every last bit of sunlight on me <laughs> when that sun comes up over the mountain. Now, it makes it impossible to see any deer because there's light in my eye, but I don't care at that point because I'm freezing. I just want the sun to shine upon me, you know, make me warm. Uh, and imagine here in a very, very, very dark, cold time in the world, a sun rising up over there, uh, up over the horizon. Finally, some real hope. Maybe for the first time in some of their lives. I mean, I don't know how long, um, you know, it, it goes from now to the time that the rapture begins. And I don't know how bad things get before the rapture uh, occurs in the seven years of tribulation. I don't have, you know, the answers to those questions. What I do know is according to scripture, there is nothing that has to happen. There's nothing that we're waiting for to occur before the rapture occurs. Um, some people think, well, we have to wait for the temple to be rebuilt, which means that the mosque that's there has to be destroyed at some point. Uh, some people think, well, we have to wait for this or these events to occur, and none of those things are true. The rapture, there is nothing preventing the rapture from occurring. Uh, we know that, they, that Israel is prepared to build that temple. They have the materials necessary. They have the instruments, the clothing for the priests. They have all of that stuff all ready for the, for the opportunity to arise for them to rebuild the temple. And they're going to do it, and they're going to do it quickly. Uh, whenever it does come, I'm very curious to know how the, what events transpire to enable them to, re, to rebuild that temple. And what happens to the mosque, you know, the Dome of the Rock that's sitting there? I don't have the answer to that question either, but there's nothing that has to occur between now and the rapture. And I don't know what events are going to transpire between now and then. But the reason the Israel, the reason, sorry, the Gentiles turn their eyes to Israel is because of God, not because of the people, not because of their intellectualism or their financial abilities or anything else or their religion, people are going to turn their eyes to them because of their God. Hey, I have great news. You and I serve the exact same God. We have the exact same Savior and Messiah. Therefore, you and I have the exact same hope. Now, this passage is directed straight at Israel. 
So let's not forget that. We can draw some application because, hey, after all, if you're saved, if you're, uh, if you, uh, you know, have Jesus Christ to save you from your sin and you've asked to do so, then you are going to be present for these events that we're reading about. I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. I don't know if we'll be near each other while we're there. Hopefully, Harold's on the way other side of Jerusalem. Uh, well, I'm just kidding. Um, hopefully, his mansion's not next door to mine, you know. But. No, it's not. No, I'm moving. <laughs> I'm going to sell it, put it on the market. Uh, anyways, uh, we're going to get to experience that. How amazing a thought is that? So let's keep reading. I've, I keep getting myself sidetracked here. Um, chapter, look at verse number four. He says, lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy son shall come from far and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. One of the things we're going to see in many of the next verses is the Gentiles bringing their power and their strength and their riches and their wealth and their influence, all of it coming to Jerusalem. We also see here the idea of thy sons coming from afar. This makes me think of a short-term fulfillment when Cyrus lets Israel return back to Jerusalem. And a future, term, a future fulfillment when Israel yet again is going to make its way back to the land of Israel. Uh, and God is going to make straight the paths and he is going to you know, bring down the mountains and dry up the rivers, so to speak. In other words, God is going to make make it easy for all of Israel to make its way, for all of the Jews to make their way back to Israel again one day too, after they were scattered. Well, let's keep reading though. He says, uh, the multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries, also camels, of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall show forth the praises of the Lord. We think about this. They're, they're bringing all the camels. These are signs of wealth. That's what they are. They're signs of wealth, and they're just going to be so numerous, they're going to cover your land. They're also going to praise the Lord, the Lord Jehovah here, God the Father. He says, all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. These places that are mentioned here are, are, are not well-known places, but they are distant, far-flung places. In other words, even the distant, far-flung places are going to be making their way to Israel, and they're going to see a light in Israel, Jesus Christ, and they're going to see hope there, and they're going to come and praise God. We continue going. He says, Who are these that fly as a cloud, and as the doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, under the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. Think about that. Of course, the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. That seems to indicate me a destruction that, go, that takes place. I wonder to myself about what kind of destruction takes place in the city of Jerusalem during the Great Tribulation um, and Battle of Armageddon. Uh, I wonder to myself, you know, what, what Israel or what Jerusalem is going to look like during that particular time period. Well, we see here that uh, the Jews are going to return. Jesus is going to return, and even the sons of the Gentiles are going to come and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Let's keep, let's keep reading. Um, and the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Think about that. God says, in my wrath... I smote thee because of your disobedience and your rebellion, but in my favor. Well, let's think about that. What brought on the favor of God? Did they suddenly start being amazing, super awesome people? They were still people. And people are still fallen. However, they do turn their hearts back to God. We see that. God rejected them for a time because of their rebellion and disobedience to him and his word. But they will begin to obey once more, and God will begin to show favor upon them once more. We get an insight here into God's psyche. We get an insight into uh, his heart as well. 
And so he's going to have mercy on them. And it's interesting he chose to use the word mercy and not grace there. His mercy indicates not being punished for the wrong things I'm still doing. So in other words, they're not going to suddenly become perfect. But he is going to show favor on them, which he is still doing even today. But he is going to show this favor on them and bring mercy on them. Therefore, listen, to look what it says about the gates. Therefore, that gate shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles and that their kings may be brought. What he's saying here is that there's just going to be so much wealth and materials being brought to Jerusalem that they will not be able to shut the gates at nighttime. There's going to be so much coming. There's going to be so much support and love coming to Jerusalem. It's so much power coming to Jerusalem. They can't even shut the gates at night. Will there be physical, literal gates or is this metaphorical? Because they don't have gates today. You know, we don't operate like that anymore with walled cities. I don't, under, I don't know the exact whether this is metaphorical or literal, but the, the idea still applies. There's going to be so much love and power, uh, material wealth being brought to Israel by the Gentiles uh, that it is going to be overwhelming. They won't be able to even handle how much is coming. We continue to read. Um, let's see here. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet Glorious. You're talking about a future temple. There is going to be a millennial temple. Something interesting about the millennial temple, there are going to be, there's, there's going to be priests for this millennial temple. And it seems like there's even going to be sacrifices in this millennial temple. But why? Well, it's certainly not because anybody's sins need to be covered by the sacrifices of bulls and goats, because we know that the sacrificial system was fulfilled and done away with when Jesus died on the cross, because he was the last sacrifice. His blood was shed to cover the sins of all mankind for all time. No longer do we need the blood of bulls and goats. That was Old Testament, a shadow of something that was to come, Jesus. It was just a shadow, but there will be a new temple. And there will be priests. Is it because we suddenly start needing a man to go between us and God again? That's what they needed in the Old Testament. They needed a priest to take that blood and sprinkle it in the mercy seat on Israel's behalf. But you and I as Christians, we don't need that, right? Do you go to a priest and confess? You may come to me and confess, but there's nothing I can do for you other than pray for you. I can't, I, I can't give you any special absolution. Um, why? Because I'm just a man. I can't forgive you for something. I can't even forgive myself for something. Only God can forgive us. Now, as believers, we have access to God. We can go straight before the throne of God and we can seek forgiveness. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. Exact words. Only mediator between God and man is Jesus Christ. So we don't need a priest. We don't need any other man to go on our behalf. So then why will there be priests? Uh, during the millennial reign at this temple. I believe it's going to be maybe for historical reasons, like this is historically how things were done, so you can see it acted out. I don't know exactly, or maybe just ceremonial reasons, but it isn't going to be for practical reasons. That's that much I can tell you, because Jesus Christ paid it all. Uh, he finished it all on the cross. He shed his blood. He covered all sins. Nothing more needs to be shed. So we talked about the future temple. Look at verse number 14. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. And all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. You know, there's a term today we hear uh, Zionists. This is, this is to use to refer to people who believe that Israel belongs in the that the Jews belong in the land of Israel as it is um, and they're so they're considered Zionists that uh, they believe that Mount Zion which is where um, the temple was built uh, well was built and currently the Dome of the Rock the Al-Aqsa Mosque stands there now uh, but and the Dome of the Rock but the the Zion they they they're, they're called the Zionists but I want to look back at verse fourteen again where he says the sons of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee so you have the fathers hated Israel hated the Jews their sons 
are coming and bowing at the feet of Israel. Let's just assume for a second here that the rapture occurs in our lifetime. Okay? Let's say the rapture occurs within the next five years. That means that seven years after that would be the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So potentially, let's say just 12 years from now, would be the beginning of the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. That would mean that the children over in the Middle East right now, whose fathers are currently actively fighting against Israel, that those children, if they survive through the Great Tribulation, will be these people that are being spoken of in verse 14. The sons of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. Now, that begs this question. Why? Why would they do that? Why would they have a sudden change of heart? Well, I think it's anything but sudden. There's going to be a whole lot of events transpire between now and then. But what changes? Does, again, again, is God shining a light here on the Jewish people and saying they're just so amazing and awesome and they're just going to win the whole world over to them? No, it has absolutely nothing to do with them. And it has absolutely everything to do with God. We continue to read and you'll see that. It says, And all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Jews. No, the city of the Lord. Again, this is Jehovah. The city of Jehovah, the Zion or the Mount of the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel is Jesus Christ. So it is the city of God. The mountain of Jesus Christ, he goes on, Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shalt suck the breast of kings, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer. Let's stop and think about that too. The Lord, this term is again Yahweh or Jehovah. He says, I am thy Savior and thy Redeemer. And we also know that Jesus Christ is the Savior and the Redeemer. What does that tell us about Jesus? It testifies to Jesus' deity, his Godship. We go on. The mighty one of Jacob. For brass I will bring gold. And for iron, I will bring silver. You know, did you want to build something out of brass? Here, use gold instead. That's better. Did you want to build something out of iron? Here, use silver. And for wood, use brass. If you want to build something out of stone, here, use iron. In other words, you're not going to be lacking for any nice thing. It will be provided. He says, I will also make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. I think it's interesting here as well. He says, I will also make thy officers peace and thine exactors righteousness. How many of us have a great level of confidence in our political leaders today? No hands? Okay. I didn't expect so. You know, it, it's like on one hand, we expect, so, we expect so much from them. But on the other hand, we also, we don't. And I, and I know that there are good guys and girls out there who are trying to do their best in leadership. I'm not, I'm not trying to label everybody with this, this brush of, of wickedness. But I tell you what, just by and large, it's hard not to in so many cases. It's so easy when you get into a position like that to just be in it for the money, for the power, influence, and then to do whatever you have to do, no matter what compromise you have to make, to keep it. It's one reason I like how Virginia uh, governors can't serve consecutive terms. I kind of like that in a sense because the governor doesn't have, as, it doesn't have incentive to compromise just so that he can keep his job for another term because he can't keep it the next term anyways. Now, he can run again later, but 
you know, in Virginia, governors can't have two consecutive terms. And that's why I'd like the idea of term limits on Senate and, 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 the, and the House of Representatives. So they don't just get there and then do whatever they've got to do to just stay there. Uh, that they feel pressure to do what they were sent there to do. But that aside, he, say, he looks at Israel and, you know, Israel, they have the same problems today that you and I have with, with political leaders. Why? Because men are men, no matter what country or nationality or skin color they are. Men are men. Men are going to be uh, in it for themselves. But he says, you're going to have officers that are peace and exactors righteousness. He says, violence shall no more be heard in thy land. I have um, an app called Telegram. You know, it's kind of like Instagram or Twitter or other things, but it's more so used by Europeans um, and other people. And the reason I downloaded it was because of when, um, when Hamas started attacking Israel, I wanted to be able to see what was going on more than what our news would tell us. And so they post a lot of stuff on there, videos, pictures, information. Well, uh, also on there uh, is the Israeli Defense Force. They Every time there's an event going on, they post about it so that the people of Israel know. And so if rockets are being fired from northern Israel and sirens are going off, they'll post that. Sirens going off in this city at this time, rockets are being fired. Or there's an incursion over there, and they'll post that kind of stuff. And I just have no, no good reason to know that information. I just am nosy, I guess, and I'm curious. And so I, I like to, to know. But you know what? Thanks, Harold. Um, I am nosy, but I like to, to know that kind of information. And I tell you what, it's, it's hourly missiles coming in from Northern Israel. Next hour, missiles coming in from into Southern Israel. Next hour, more alarms going off. Next hour, more alarms going off. Car bombs, uh, kidnappings. I mean, there's just nonstop violence going on over there right now in all of that area. But it will not be so during this time. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land. You know, I was thinking about it. How bad would things have to get for my neighborhood to be as bad as things are in Israel right now? Or Gaza? I mean, my, my little old neighborhood out in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. How bad would things have to get for me to be worried about mobs of people coming up my road? For me to have to worry about bombs dropping or missiles coming into my neighborhood? I mean. Things would have to be pretty bad all around the world for it to be that bad in the Shenandoah Valley, in my neighborhood. We're blessed in that sense. We live in a time of peace where we can just tisk tisk people on the other side of the world for their bad decisions and live in almost perfect safety. Well, the time is going to come where they're going to have that kind of safety too. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy wall salvation and thy gates praise. We go on and I want to finish the chapter here. We'll just have to modify our prayer time, but I want to get it done. It says this, the sun shall be no more, uh, no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. And thy God, thy glory, thy sun shall no more go down. Neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. Let's stop there for a second. Um, over in Revelation 21, and I just want to read the verses real quickly. Uh, you don't have to turn there. But Revelation 21, verses 23 and 24, we see um, the future fulfillment of these verses. In Revelation 21, 23, and 24, it says, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. Does that sound a whole lot like Isaiah, what we just read? That's almost identical to it. They didn't need the sun or the moon to, 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 to light the city, because the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. The Lamb, as it was slain, is Jesus. Verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, the city, the new Jerusalem. And so we go back to where we just read. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. But you know what's even better than that? The next phrase. And thy God, thy glory. You know, there's a whole lot of things that America can be proud of. There's things that Americans can be ashamed of. 
But the things that we can glory in as a country, anything good that we have as a country, you know, I've said this before as a Christian, anything good that you see in me is not me. And it's not my wife you know, either, you know, coming through me. It's God coming through me. It's his righteousness. It's not my own goodness. And anything good that is coming out of the United States of America, I wholeheartedly believe it is because of the biblical founding of this country. And the men who believed in God and trusted in God and had their faith in God who were part of the founding of this country. They weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We can't expect them to be. They were men. If I don't expect myself to be perfect, I can't have expected them to be perfect either. But any goodness that we see in this country or in our past or in our future can only come from God's word and from obedience. And really, what is it? It's not our glory. You know, we call our flag old glory. But here the verse says, and thy God, thy glory, referring to the future city of Israel. What is their glory going to be? Not their armies or their technology or their farming or their infrastructure. Their glory is going to be God. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy people also shall be all righteousness. They shall inherit the land forever. Let's think about that. That land that is so hotly contested even to this day. It says they shall inherit that land forever. I don't know if Israel, if the Jews are going to get chased out of the land of Israel in the next 10 years, before the tribulation or during the tribulation, before they're finally able to go back into it again. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. But what I do know is this. When Jesus comes, it's theirs. Forever. That's what the Bible tells us. He gave them that land on purpose, promised it to them back when Abraham, thousands of years before they were even a nation, he promised it to Abraham. And here he promises through Isaiah that, that it is going to be theirs forever and that he is going to be their everlasting light. He says, they shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting. He does the work. He does the planting. They're the branch. The work of my hands. God does the work. Why? That I may be glorified. Not so that they can be glorified, but that God can be glorified. He's going to do the work. He's going to do something miraculous that no man could have done, that no leader or army could have done. He wants the glory. He says, a little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it. When? When? In his time. And so now, we wait. We don't know when these events are going to occur exactly, but we know they're going to occur. And we have that great blessedness to look forward to because, yes, this passage is directed to Israel, but praise the Lord, you and I are going to be there to witness it because we're going to be a part of it. We're going to be in that city. You and I, if, unless your back is still bad, which I hope it's not, you and I are going to be picking up stones and we're going to be rebuilding. We're going to be a part of it. You and I are going to get to walk into, with our two very own feet, the new temple, the millennial temple. And rather than just a physical manifestation of God's presence there, there's going to be a real Jesus Christ, Son of God, yet Son of Man, Messiah, Savior, Redeemer. There is going to be God in that temple. And for finally, we are going to be able to see him with our very own eyes. And we're going to be able to hear his voice and finally know what it sounds like. To know what his face is like. To finally know what the face of ultimate love looks like. And we're going to be able to share and revel not in our glory or even in Israel's glory during this time, but we're going to be able to share and revel in God's glory during this time. So chapter number 60 wasn't, that, that really it was, it was hard to find a way to make application to us, to be honest with you. It's such a happy chapter, and it's such a prophetic chapter. It feels like it's just so far distant from 
where I sit today, you know. But I tell you what, it, it's such a hope that we have. So when you turn on the news, you want to get yourself all worked up for no reason. You know, understand this. All of this ridiculousness is going to pass. And there's going to be peace. But it isn't going to be until Jesus returns. So in the meantime, we don't just go and hide ourselves in a hole. In the meantime, as long as God gives us breath, we are to serve, serve, serve God. We are to be lights, testimonies, witnesses, and as I said before, reflect the love of God and the grace of God in our lives. At work, at home, with our families, even when we want to pull our hair out, which is where I find myself quite often with four little kids, um, showing the love of Christ and the grace of God in our lives.